Chuck, what's going on, man? You ready to do number six? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, guys, welcome to uh, episode six of the Condra Lounge. And uh, we got an awesome episode that we uh, are recording for you guys. And uh, this is our quickest turnaround. We're actually recording the night before release. I was just on vacation. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this. Chuck, I, I, thank you again. You got a lot of connections in the Condra community and... Uh, getting to to look at our guests uh condros that he has is going to be awesome um but we are having dave d with vibrant veritas on to talk all about his journey keeping and breeding green tree pythons some know dave as having one of the best chondro collections in the world and we are going to talk a lot about that i'm going to be pulling up his instagram um because i don't say that lightly there's a lot of amazing collections that i've had the opportunity to see online, right? Um, and uh, Dave's animals just speak for themselves. But besides his amazing collection, what we are going to continue to do here at the Condra Lounge when we have great guests on is um, bring you behind the scenes on the decisions that Dave has made uh, and the details and things that he does to be successful at breeding chondros um, and his mindset on the animals that he keeps um me being new into chondros and trying to be as selective as possible with the collection i am keeping and what i'm trying to achieve i think that dave is probably one of the best people i could talk to because i i don't know i've gone through his page chuck and i haven't seen a single average animal on there so um yeah i'm i'm excited to to get into his head about all that yeah he's uh this collection is very extensive and I appreciate the compliment. However, I definitely don't have a connection to Dave D. He is, um, he's like an international rock star playing globally. And I'm sitting there playing guitar heroes, licking the Cheetos <laughs> dust off my fingers in my garage. So um, I just been lucky enough that uh, he, he was nice enough to respond and, and agree awesome. to the show. It didn't take a lot of um, uh, coaxing or, or, you know, convincing. So um I want to thank him for that, for being easily accessible and, you know, talking to the little guys. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited, Chuck. If you're ready, let's go ahead and bring them on. Whether you've poured your heart and soul into your reptile business or you've just begun your business journey, AE Foundry has you covered with next level expertise in graphic design, motion graphics, videography, photography, and so much more. If you've been dying for a new logo for your reptile business, motion graphics for your current logo, a new website, or need assistance making your video podcast come to life, then listen carefully. AE Foundry's mission places storytelling at its core. AE Foundry believes that a distinctive story and background are the driving forces that set your brand apart. In today's market, consumers seek more than just products. They crave a connection built on trust with the brands they cherish. AE Foundry is committed to empowering small businesses and fostering authenticity that resonates with their consumers. Reach out to them and let them help you craft a visual narrative that helps establish a genuine and lasting connection with your audience. To contact AE Foundry, email them at aromero at aefoundry.com or on Instagram at aefoundry. What's going on, Dave? Hi guys, thanks for having me on. Up, Absolutely. Brother? Yeah, man, anytime that we can uh get someone on that uh has the animals that you do like we were talking about, um I I'm I'm excited to to kind of get inside your head and hear what you have to say about Green Tree Python. So um if if you don't mind, can you kind of tell us like what your introduction into like herpeticulture in general or into green tree pythons? You can start as far back as you want to go, but just like what led you into green tree pythons and when did that begin? Uh, well, when I was a kid, my parents always recognized my interest in animals. So uh, 
uh, I think in kindergarten, I went to school half days. And then in the afternoon, my mom would take me to parks and the zoo and things like that. And um, we went to a, a picnic at Red Rocks. Red Rocks is a state park here in Colorado. It's a big concert venue, if you've ever heard of that. But uh, you can also hike around. And when we returned to the car, there was a rattlesnake coiled next to one of the tires. Nice. And my dad killed it with a rock. Um, he's he's not really an animal killer. I don't know if he thought it was necessary to get in the car. But anyway, I, apparently my mom thought I was going to have nightmares or something from that encounter. So she sewed a large stuffed animal snake for me. That's and, a good mom. That's dude, cool. moms are the best, man. That's cool <laughs> shit. Yeah, I don't I don't remember if that's why I like reptiles, but that's one of my earliest reptile stories. And then uh, a year or two later, my parents bought my sister, who's three years older than me, a pair of ribbon snakes, puffy and toughy, and one of them ate the other, and they both ended up dying. So Damn. I remember that. And then uh, we moved a few years later, and I would spend a lot of time in the field below my parents' house looking for different kinds of garter snakes. And if I was lucky, I'd find a bull snake or a yellow-bellied racer. And then um, got my first pet snake when I was six. It was a corn snake. And over the years, I had kind of a postage stamp type collection where I have one of this and one of that. I never bred anything. When I was 21 or 22, I ended up selling all my snakes and then about five years later, I saw rough scale pythons were available on kingsnake.com. So I bought those. And during my time trying to learn about them, I came across the Morelia viridis forum because uh, green tree pythons are apparently their closest relative. Right. And then after learning about green tree pythons on the forum, I bought one, I don't know, probably six months later from a a guy on that forum and I dove in pretty hard. Yeah. I, I feel say. like it's real, real, um, you know, I, it's my personality. Anybody who's listened to the other show that I do the retake lounge, um, you know, when I have an interest in an animal, I like to, to get my hands on that animal, but I will say with chondros, um, specifically, there's just something about them when you get them, it's real easy to just continue to dive in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was definitely, aware of those stereotypes before I got my first one that they're that they're bitey or that they're hard to take care of so that's what kept me from getting one earlier than that plus they really weren't accessible there's right. a local reptile shop that I grew up going to here in Denver and I probably only saw one over the course of more than a decade so I didn't pull the trigger until I got back into reptiles do you remember what what your first chondro was yeah there was a breeder named greg stevens in maryland and uh he had a, a blue line pairing i think it was um the parents were a blue line bred to an aru and a blue line bred to a maruki okay so he ended up with babies with a lot of black so i bought okay. a female from him that she was probably 18 months old, maybe a little younger than that. She had a, she had a lot of black, but it was the type of black that, that most of it ended up fading. But I only had her for a couple of years. She got, uh, she had lumps on her underside, abscesses, apparently. I, I guess snakes don't produce pus the way we do when they get an infection. They produce this, this crystallized abscess sort of thing. And it, the, the bloodstream can't, dissipate it and carry it away. So you have to surgically remove it. So I took her to the veterinary college, uh, hour or two away and, uh, she didn't make it. Oh man. What, what year was this around when you got your first one? 2012. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I, for my mindset, I, again, looking through your website and on your page and everything, I'm, I was trying to get a timeline of all this stuff. And that mm -hmm. was one thing that I couldn't do. So that, that at least gives me a, a starting point. So that's good. Yeah, I bought quite a few adults, and uh, so I have I have some snakes that were from two thousand eight. So, how many animals awesome. do you how many animals do you have? Um, uh, probably about a hundred. Wow, all awesome. green trees. Oh well, majority green trees because you do have roughs, and do you have bolins? 
I don't have the rough scales anymore. Yeah, I have bones. I probably have 100 green tree pythons and probably 20 non-green tree pythons. Okay. And where, where's like majority of those lines? Like, what are you mainly working with? Where did your founders at, founder animals come from? Oh, um, I have a lot of blue line stuff. I have calico. I have tiger stripe stuff from Rico. Most of the tiger stripe stuff I produced myself from one a female that I got from him. Do, do, do you have? A, did, did you ever? Um, I guess I'm uh, sorry to interrupt. No did you ever collab with uh, Justin Wilbanks when he was alive? Because uh, I know he no. worked heavily with the tiger stripe stuff. If I wasn't mistaken, in Bioc. He bought a he bought a tiger stripe from me. Okay, nice. Got gotcha. you. So continue. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, you're good. Uh, and then some probably lesser known lines, and I don't even know if they're really that distinct. But I, I have a a really black female from Sandro de Pinto, and she was produced from his his male called Insanity. Mm. Okay. Um, and then I have some Versace stuff from Marshall, but it was bred with Calico. Okay, cool. Man, um, so, so I got one more thing. So, so digging deeper than that, if you do have just a was a modge podge of all kinds of different stuff that you've created to really establish the type of animals that you have, I mean, you you have a look, right? I can look at an animal and say that's most likely a Dave D animal. I mean, you do have some really distinct looks that come out of your collection. What would you say? from a person the outside looking in if you had to judge yourself not being yourself would you say possibly you're starting a line or have you established a line have you have you proved out certain phenotypes um no i have some ideas of producing things that are that are unique but really i've just taken existing lines and tried to breed them to things that complement them Okay. Like I, I have the orangish tiger stripe female and I bred her to some males with a lot of yellow or kind of a yellowish orange just to bring that out. So I don't know. I was, I was thinking about that. I, I don't know if you'll ever, ever be able to call something a new line unless you start with pretty fresh imports or, and, and breed those. Otherwise, it can get, it's just a continuation. Right. That's fair. That's fair. I didn't mean to put you on the spot with that. I mean, you're you're in your you're pretty uh, humble person. So I just I say that because you don't produce green snakes. And correct <laughs> me if I'm wrong. Your snakes don't turn green. They're some every color do. but that. Yeah, some I mean, of them do. Most of them don't. Yeah, it's 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 unbelievable to have you know uh, the amount of animals that you're producing. Um. And the the phenotypes that they're they're displaying into adulthood is just it's a, it's unbelievable. You're doing some really cool shit, uh, for lack of better words. I mean, your stuff is unbelievable. It really is. And you don't brag. I mean, you just you just put pictures up and you do your thing. And I'm super excited because I, I get to ask you all these incubation and breeding questions that that normally um you know. I wouldn't be able to find out just by looking on the internet. Cause I think I, I would probably say uh, fr from the little that I know about you, but I do follow you a lot and, and not knowing you personally, I would say you're, you're pretty, you, you keep to yourself for the most part. You don't put yourself out there. You're not a very loud person in the community. Your sp your snakes are kind of your voice. I mean, your production speak for themselves. I, I, I wasn't even planning on bringing up your Instagram just yet, but you know, Chuck mentioned that you don't produce, um, green snake. So I just kind of wanted to go through your page because that's exactly what I was thinking earlier when I was scrolling through it. But I, I wanted to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you posted this snake, um, you know, probably a little over a year ago on your page. What's the information with this animal? Because I got one of those uh, Tamika Aru crosses from uh, Gary Shavino that was produced over, I think, at Fascination Herbs. And uh, this is exactly what the snake that I got from him looks like it's going through. It's not quite there with the blue powder yet, but every shed it gets closer and closer to that. Oh, well, that's a 75% sky topaz snake. Okay. And I can't remember if that's one. I also posted a more recent picture of, but um, yeah, most of its clutch mates are blue. 
Yeah, that's a phenomenal animal. Um, so, you know, I, I was going to kind of ask this um, down the road when we hop into breeding, but, you know, Chuck kind of started inquiring about this. So I figured I might as well throw this in now, but um, you're in a position where you've worked hard to get some of the best designer animals that are out there. Um, you know, speak a little bit more, if you don't mind, about how you go about selecting the pairings that you decide to do um, and how many pairings you shoot for in a season. Like, I know that you mentioned, you know, you had a, a orange tiger stripe and bred it to a, a male that had some yellow oranges. So that that's mm -hmm. an idea. But like, what what else are you looking at and what are you doing when you're you're looking at your pairings? Oh, I keep it pretty simple. If I want blue snakes, then I'll try and breed two blue snakes together. If I want multicolored snakes, then I might mix things up. But all of my snakes, with the exception of a possible het from Rico, possible het for albino, were red. Mm -hmm. And I think the majority of them are also red dominant. Okay. So I, you know, people will talk about red versus yellows, and I'm not here to shit on yellows. But if you want, if you want, really weird looking snakes you probably want red snakes obviously you can produce beautiful high yellows and tricolors and high whites and localities with yellows but i haven't seen a lot of that from a lot of a lot of uh, other colors like oranges and blues and there there are a few with black but for the most part you want reds if you're going for those colors right Right. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a keep it simple, stupid method. Right. And, and, and I mean, it, it's, you'd be surprised how many people in, in, uh, or at least from my experience in other areas of the reptile industry that don't know how to bring out a phenotypic mm -hmm. expression. They just kind of are plugging and playing, not realizing that the two different mutations are putting together are, are canceling out what makes each of them good. Um, but yeah, I like the approach. Yeah. Um, kind of lost my train of thought. Let's see here. I, I, I also consider how related they are and what their parents look like and that sort of thing. At the end of the day, it, it's selective breeding. So like you said, if you want a blue snake, you probably don't want to just breed it to any old locality. If, if you have, let's let's say you have a blue male, and unless your goal is to think a couple generations away and and take the offspring from that pairing, if you want just to get some diversity in the blood later on, if you want to produce blue snakes, you should really look at a whether or not they're both blue, or if not. Um, maybe the female is green, but her parents are blue and you're going to put her with the blue male. That's really what you want to do. If you're bringing, breeding jungle carpet pythons, you're not going to breed a muddy ass one. Right. You know, and hope for yellow. That's just not how it works. Right. Um, all right. Let's, let's jump into husbandry. Um, so I want to ask you for someone buying their first chondro, how do you recommend that they set up their enclosure and are there any specific brands of enclosures that you like temp um and then obviously what we'll, we'll get into you know temperature humidity substrate like what are you recommending for someone getting into chondros um well racks would be the short answer i only sell yearlings and older just because i want to see how the snakes turn out after their color change and keep the ones that i like for myself so that that plays a role sometimes people buy snakes from me and they're big enough to go directly into a cage so that can work but uh, racks are probably your best bet just because of the security that they provide and they maintain hum humidity really well so if they're getting a yearling from you what size rack tub are you recommending typically um probably a, a tw uh, 12 quart or okay. bigger they can be kind of cramped in a 12 quart, but sometimes that's not a bad thing because they feel secure. But a lot of people like the five gallon Cambro tubs. Those work well too. Yeah. Sold a couple of snakes and they, in the past year and people were using those Cambro tubs and, and they didn't want to eat initially, but then they covered the front with paper and then 
the snakes wanted to eat. So you just have to be ready to adapt if you encounter something like that. Right. Yeah, I got one of my chondros uh, will literally bite and wrap and will hold on to that that mouse um, literally until you shut the lights off. If the lights aren't off in the garage, um, I've mm-hmm. seen it wrap and just hanging for two hours. And then I leave, come back 20 minutes later, and it's gone. Um, they, it's funny how each of them have their own quirks when it comes to feeding. Yeah, if you mess with them too much, you can you can fuck them up. You can stress them out. I had a snail, a snail, a snake from Mister Blue bred to. I think I think she was called a Womena, even though chondros don't come from Womena. Um, so that was kind of a special snake, and it ate for me the first time I got it, and then the second time it was a little bit hesitant. So I kind of fucked with it with the the hopper, and after that, it would not eat. I actually mm-hmm. stepped it too. Jason Stevens, who lives, I don't know, 45 minutes from me just to see if he'd have any luck. Cause at the time he had a lot more experience than I did and he got it to eat in a knoll. And I think that was about it. So, you know, most of them aren't that delicate or that sensitive, but you can stress them out if you're not patient. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, negatively imprinting. Uh, you got some people in the community that say, Oh, you got to beat the shit out of them. To get a yeah, I don't. I don't believe that's the case. I don't want to associate fear with the smell of a prey item. Yeah, I have some holdbacks that I recently moved to a bigger rack, and there were savages in the little tubs. And then they were a little bit hesitant once I moved them. So I thought, oh, I'm just gonna tap their neck a little bit, and uh, it made it worse. So now some of them are, like you said, Lucas, just eating mice that I leave on the bottom on the floor, and I I know that they'll bounce back and turn into savages again. But it's, uh, it's, you have to be patient and I'm not very patient. <laughs> it's hard to, re- it's like, I got this mouse here, so I can either throw it away or I can force you to eat it. And most of the time I'm not you thinking correctly and I'll, I'll try and get him to force him to eat it, but that's right. not the right move. Right. Um, I've even tried the, the, beat up method with a, a young uh biok that i got and uh didn't i mean that like all it needed at the most what once it f- like finally figured it out was just like a little tap on the neck but like right. i i definitely set it a few steps back when i i was just all over it and and just stressing it out um yeah a lot of people talk about runners right when it comes to like neos and everything and and um I don't know, to me, like a runner is a scared snake. Um, and so, yeah, I think imprinting is one of those things that Chuck has talked about before that, um, I don't know, it's hard. I, I, I see, I, I hear a lot of breeders have success with the beat up method, but I also, coming from a psychology background in my personal life, know that, you know, it, it, it can have an adverse effect too. Yeah, I definitely use tease feeding as a method to get babies established. Um, but um, for snakes that are stressed and off food, that's where I've run into problems trying to do that because that's not why they're eating. With babies, they don't recognize pinky mice as food, so you're right. trying to elicit a strike. But um, right. it's a different situation with a snake that has eaten you know, 40, 50 times or more, and it, it's not willing to eat because it's stressed. Yeah. That's like that Jayapur female. I just got a fresh import. I mean, mm-hmm. beautiful animal, 700 grams plus. She wouldn't take a frozen thawed rat to save her life. So I put a little chick down on its nose. She took it right nice. away. This is, this is a breeder size adult female that was, you know, just got in off the boat. And it's just weird. And now she's still kind of hesitant, like taking the rats, but she does take them. She bites them a couple of times, but I mean, I wasn't going to, Beat the crap out of a 700 gram steak that just was shipped over in a Coca Cola bottle. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so, about uh, temperature um, and humidity, all that good stuff when it comes to your husbandry, um, what, what are you recommending and what are you doing? Well, my babies and yearlings they have in their own room, <clears throat> basically a, a big closet. And I just use uh, an oil-filled heater to heat the entire room. It's about 81 degrees all the time. 
And I really like that because I, I've used racks with heat tape before, and especially with bottom heat, it creates a lot of condensation on the, the underside of the rack, you know, the ceiling of each tub. So then you pull out the tub and there's water everywhere. But if you heat the entire room, you don't get that condensation. So I really like that. Plus, it's also, it seems like less of a fire risk to just have right. one heater in there versus all this heat tape that's bent and snaked through a rack. And, you, and you're not you're not night dropping them, are you? I might have a one degree night drop or something like that, but I don't think it's anything. It's either 81 all the time or it's 81 and 80 or something like that. Is that, okay. Does that differ? Go ahead, go ahead, Lucas. No, I was going to say, and that's that's for the younger animals, right? Uh -huh. yep. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I've, you know, I keep all of my animals on on strictly ambient, and I got some animals that were about six months old, and it was during the cooler season when it cooled down, and you know, during the daytime it gets up to you know, eighty three, eighty four, and at night drops down to like seventy eight, and mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of people were telling me like, hey, you might want to put the younger animals, or when you produce them, have some heat tape just like and just set the heat tape to like 82 even if your ambient is 82 83 um you know but i didn't see any adverse reaction so i i find it interesting i like that i'm hearing from you that you know for your younger animals 81 all the way around like they don't need that 84 85 hot spot mm -hmm. yeah i i would think what you're doing is fine because you're keeping them a little bit warmer during the day so if you're dropping a few degrees lower at night that's not a big deal yeah, I mean, my my daytime high is about 84, and then during the summer, it gets down to 81. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, during the winter, daytime high is like 83, and nighttime lows this last year was 78, 77. I might drop it down to 75 this year. We'll see. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Are we'll, you using oil filled here? No, I have a, a mini split. A mini split, okay. Yeah, so I'm able to cool and yeah, because during the summer here, um, I need AC running to keep the, you know, I dirt like I'll set the thermostat to 86 degrees and that keeps my my room at 83. Um, mm -hmm. Like I'll set it on cool to 86 and it keeps my room at 83. But here in Texas, if I if I don't have AC, um, <clears throat> even as well as the insulation that I've put in my garage and completely just renovated it, um, my garage will still get. To 90 when it's yeah. 110 degrees outside yeah so um yeah i love it and um you know we'll, we'll talk about the the move here and your your thoughts that are coming up here shortly but um uh, about husbandry when it comes to um like designing green tree python enclosures um what do you focus on doing like for your adults um well i've used a lot of different cages and there isn't a single commercially available cage right now that i think is perfect ideally i would, I would like something like a vision that's molded with rounded corners that you don't have to seal and that's easy to clean but that doesn't i don't like visions because they have all kind of lips all kinds of lips and bumps and shit in them and they have a bunch of vents but if i could just get a tub without all that extra nonsense that would be my ideal cage so what's your uh, size because i mean i guess you're not you're not keeping like in because I, I have I, I bred in a cambro my last clutch yeah uh most of my cages right now are 18 inches high uh, 30 inches wide and 24 inches deep that's perfect I, I i like a 30 18 18 if i'm ever gonna you know just do a mass order just to get all my cages 30 18 18 or 30 18 24 deeps perfect i don't I, I think that they don't need necessarily need a lot of height really the heights uh, so you don't get your hand taken off from the nasty ones when you're trying to change your water yeah yeah I, uh, I like them a little lower i think it's easier for them to reach the water if you're setting it on the floor mm -hmm. of the cage yeah for sure um i have a uh he's a sponsor of the retic lounge heartland reptiles he has these um awesome awesome um high i wish i knew the the 
technical engineering term for the aluminum enclosures that he builds, but mm-hmm. um, I've convinced him to start designing chondro enclosures um, because they are just phenomenal. I have one in my garage for my retic. Um, they're smooth on the inside and um, you know, they're, they're essentially bulletproof and will outlive any five snakes that you put in them. Um, it's the same type of metal that is used in storage containers that are outside in, in the weather for hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's getting a design going. I, I plan to pick some up when he gets them completed. So I'll let you know how that goes. Yeah. I'd like to check those out. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want to assemble anything and I don't want to seal anything. And then if you have a snake that dies or whatever, and you want to put another snake in there, a lot of those, Cages have a lot of rough surfaces from where they um, machined away layers of PVC to make a door frame or stuff like that. So it's just not the easiest thing to sanitize. Right. Um, let's see here. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm slacking here. Um, so <clears throat> with husbandry in mind. Uh-huh also going into uh both feeding and then breeding so first a question is it's a multi-part question how are you keeping your adults regularly that you're not breeding to start the question Uh, okay yeah i keep them in those cages i described the dimensions and then have uh pro products radiant radiant heat panels in there i have two perches in each cage the perches are both the same height just because i want the snakes to choose their location based solely on temperature and not because they feel more secure sitting on a a higher perch versus a lower perch that was my thought there i don't know if that makes any sense but so i have two parallel perches in each cage and i use uh it's called acetron which is uh really dense plastic i get it from i think it's called usplastics.com they sell all kinds of sheets and of plastic and they sell this rod it's black so that's what i use for purchase i use a puppy pad oh they're not even puppy pads they're incontinence pads these are for hospital patients i use that mostly for substrate for the adults my cages have almost no ventilation in them um, it's really dry here. So people talk about snakes getting sick because of stagnant air, but then they keep babies in tubs, which have almost no airflow. So I don't think that's a thing. So anyway, not only that, if you're changing waters frequently, they're getting fresh air in there anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, they get enough air that they don't suffocate, but, um, just don't, just, just don't let shit sit at the bottom for seven days without opening the enclosure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like misting because I think that creates an opportunity for a lot of bacteria and whatnot. So I just keep it humid by by putting a, most of the cages I use have two water bowls in them. And I use these uh, disposable bowls I get from a Webstrant store that have pretty big surface area. And then, uh, let's see, I think I said I use Pro Products heat panels. The The room is normally heated to about 75 degrees. And uh, that's with the uh, oil-filled radiant heater. I use an Inkbird thermostat for that. It's basically the only one I've found that can handle 1,500 watts and also has a night drop. Yep. A lot of people shit on the Inkbird thermostats, man, but they've I've, I've had a couple. I've used them for oil, uh, oil-filled oil heaters, and um, they've always worked flawless for me. A lot of people will tell you, go, go Johnson, go Renko, you know, spend the – you know, get it wired in, spend the $500, whatever the case may be. And the ink birds have not steered me wrong when it comes to, and, and I'm only speaking to the oil filled heaters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've used a Johnson a 419. I, I think there's a way to rig up a night drop, but I'm not that handy. So it's always yeah. easy with ink bird. I was using a Herbstat. I think it was called a Herbstat HP, something like that for high power. Yeah. And anytime there was any, um, I don't even know the word because it, it wouldn't take a, it wouldn't take a blackout for this fucking thing to freak out. Just like, I don't know if, if there was just a little glitch in the current, 
the whole thing would reset and it would happen multiple times a week and they stopped selling them. I don't know if that's why, but I was using that for a while and it was a piece of shit. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> digging deeper, uh, yeah. how are you keeping your adults with hot side, cold side, and are you running a year round night drop? Yeah, the hot side is normally about 85 degrees under the heat panel, and it's on for 12 hours, and and then uh, it drops down to, I think, 78 at night. So there is a night drop year-round. Okay. And, and then the cool side... Uh, during the day, the room heats up a little bit just because you got all those heat panels running. So even though the thermostat's set to 75 normally, but it might be a little bit warmer because all the heat panels are heating up the room and um, there's also sunlight getting in there. And then during the winter, I uh, changed the setting on the Inkbird to 72 at night. So they drop a little bit more. And then I lower the night temperature on the herb stats for each of their cages. So they don't get any nighttime heat at all. Okay. Okay. Wow. So you, not only are you keeping year round night drop, you're also fiddling with temperatures when you want them to breed or are you specifically lowering it in the winter time? Is that when you quote unquote have your season? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. So when you're, you, when you're fiddling with the temps, it's because you want them to do something you want them to do yeah okay okay um so before we we like even jump in further into to breeding um you know you mentioned prior to us recording day that you are moving um <laughs> and you are considering some husbandry switch ups so um first you're you're moving uh, how far are you moving from where you are how about half an hour Okay. Um, any, any thought behind the idea? Um, I, I get people that I have people ask me this all the time. If I've ever moved animals and they ask like, how'd you move them? Those kind of things. I feel like it'd be useful to go into, um, some information on that. So how do you plan to transport them? Well, I've ordered a bunch of cages. I don't have, haven't received them yet, but once I do, I'm going to get them all set up and get my room squared away. And then I'm just going to take the snakes out of their cages here, put them in, you know, big deli cups or whatever, and drive them over there. So I'm not going to move their cages. Okay. Uh, we're not going to sell this current house until everything's settled over there. So I'll sell all my old shit, and the snakes will be set up in the new, in the new house. Okay. That's. I mean, that's that's about as less stressful, least stressful as possible. Um, yeah. Having, that, having that ability to kind of get established over in one area before you got to, you know, because moving can be one of those things where, you know, you, you close on a house and got to get everything out of the house, which means cages, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's stressful on me for sure. I'm kind of a tortoise in terms of getting things done. I chip away at things. I don't want to, you know, kill myself in one day. So that's my yeah. plan there. Yeah, I my 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 spirit wants to function in that manner but i tend to wait last minute for everything so i always uh, overdo shit so mm -hmm. <laughs> um you you were talking about flirting with the idea of changing how you do husbandry and maybe making a switch over to ambient tell us a little bit about that yeah i'm gonna have three snake rooms over there plus a, a big closet for babies so two of those rooms will be available for green tree pythons and I'm toying with the idea of keeping one group in one of the rooms in ambient conditions. I do, I do have several snakes right now that I keep ambient, but I'm not my breeders. So that they just, they're more steady than what I would do. Uh, but I like the idea of ambient because it seems safer once again, than having dozens of heat panels that could potentially catch on fire. Yeah. Also with the snakes that I keep, uh, under ambient temperatures currently, they seem to stay more hydrated. Yes. The if you have, people talk about condensation in egg boxes, well, if you have a adult cage with a heat panel inside, you kind of have the same issue. But except all that all that uh, humidity inside the cage is being sucked out because of the 
temperature differential. It's cooler outside of the cage, so it's it's sucking all the humidity out. If you have a room that's heated to 83 or whatever, the, the humidity isn't going to want to leave the cage. Right. You know, I and I not to try to convince you, but I, I, I think that so I kept on a gradient before, and again, I'm just going to disclaimer for anyone who might be listening for the first time. Um, you know, I, I keep retakes. So, I mean, it's still pythons from Indonesia. So husbandry and breeding parameters, very similar. Um, I'd say retakes are definitely, they can withstand more, um, I guess, lack of better words, neglect or, or just, you know, uh, issues with husbandry. They can withstand it probably a little bit better than Contros, but, um, when I switched over to ambient, um, I noticed way better sheds. I noticed more mm -hmm. movement and activity. Um, my theory behind the movement and activity is because it takes energy to thermoregulate. Um, if they need heat, they're going to sit under the heat. If they need to be cooler, they're going to sit on the cooler side. Um, when you're keeping your room a, a comfortable temperature for them, um, they don't have a need to have to sit on a certain side. Um, so I saw them moving a lot more. Um, it, it eliminated the pushing issue that I have with, with that, that people have with retics. Um, and, uh, you know, it's crazy when, when I talk to people that, you know, like you, for example, you're in Colorado's dry by my, uh, co-host on the retic lounge is, uh, in Utah. So super dry. Um, I don't hear a lot of people doing this, but my garage, the way that I have it set up is I have an evaporative humidifier. So it's a humidifier that does not release mist into yeah. the room. So it's not going to build moisture up on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, and I set that to like 65%. And then I have a dehumidifier plugged in um, set to, to 65%. Um, or 70. And so that way, any time that the humidity might go to 70, the dehumidifier just kicks on and, and drops it down so that my humidity is staying constant. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, humidifiers have been a, a complete game changer and the dehumidifier as well, because I, I basically have my room just set to where it's a constant humidity level and there's no you know, there's, there's maybe a 10% change and I'm wondering why I don't see more of that. Um, it's, but have you considered doing a humidifier system? Yeah, I use, I use humidifiers and I oh, use, okay, cool. use an ultra, what are they called? Ultrasonic. Yeah. The, yeah. And, um, I used to have to go buy gallons and gallons of distilled water because our tap water has a lot of minerals in it and, um, it creates dust if you use that. And then, I, and then I got a evaporative humidifier like you're talking about, and you don't have to worry about any of those nice. minerals leaching out because they just get stuck in the filter. Yeah. yeah. So I do use a humidifier, but I have found that it's not as necessary to run that with um, with keeping the cages under ambient conditions. Yeah, no, it's it's a lot less of a – you don't have the uh, the heat panel going through. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you said you use Pro Product heat panels those are expensive and that's another thing that i've enjoyed with my ambient setup is you know mm -hmm. anytime i get a new enclosure i don't have to spend 150 bucks on a heat panel and stack up on thermostats left and right so i don't i i've i've have nothing but amazing things to say about ambient setup now i've successfully bred my retics so i don't know how it's gonna go with i mean I think for me, I would have my doubts, even if I kept it in a gradient situation with, with breeding chondro successfully, but that that's just part of the game, I guess. I don't know if anyone has tried. Uh, well, I know, I know people who have touted keeping them ambient and, and it's along the lines of keep them 78 to 82 during the day and do that year round and you can breed them. But I don't know if anyone has tried keeping them, I don't know, 85 during the day and then and then cooling them at night particularly or maybe cooling them a little bit more in the winter uh, without right. using any type of basking for gravid females but i my understanding is the the farm bushmaster gets and used to get more babies from i think it's called terraria indonesia they 
they keep all their green tree pythons in an open air building without any extra heat. So you you might want to try. I don't know. Did you offer your females your gravid retics a basking spot? No, I don't. No. So no. I don't know why green trees would be that different, but I'm not aware of anyone. Yeah, and that was one yeah. thing I probably was gonna. I've just I've talked to Ryan Young in depth about it, and um, um, and while I'm new at chondros and trying to eliminate any variables that can you know, potentially make things uh, less successful. I was just going to, I can install a, a ceramic heat emitter um, uh -huh. and uh, just a low wattage one just to provide a little bit of heat for like four hours a day. But even he's only running it for four hours a day and at night he's not running it. Um, so it's still dropping down cooler at night for him. And they they seem to be, seem to be, okay but um yeah uh, it's definitely going to be a plug and play thing for sure as i get the experience with pairing and <clears throat> breeding chondros but um so how yeah, long do your female retics get when they're driving 85 um so if my room is so the way that my my setup is is 84 is typically the peak of my day and that that peak will last like maybe an hour hour and a half mm -hmm. and then it starts to just gradually decline but if you look at the average temperature in my room throughout any day it's generally between like high 81 to mid 82. Okay. um but yeah i when my females are gravid if my room is 84 i've seen my females at 86.8 I'd, Im I'd imagine if, if you kept them like that and you did try to do that and didn't provide any supplemental heat I mean, maybe the worst thing you experience is just taking a little bit longer to lay the eggs, you know? Yeah, and that's that, like I prolong the egg deposition. Yeah, exactly. And that that's that's what I'd noticed with my retics. Instead of like the thirty two to thirty five days, they'll take thirty five to, to forty five days, but the eggs there come out go. fine and you know, heat is what kills. Um, you know, when it comes to eggs, even if you think about it like incubating, right? Um you can probably hatch chondros at 82 degrees. It's just not going to take 50 days. It's probably going to take like 65. Um, but you know, I, and, and again, I'm using that based off of, you know, what I've noticed with my other species, but again, they're, they're pythons from the same area. Um, so yeah, cooler, you know, low and slow, right. Is what people tend to say. So, um, but, but I am going to be, uh, you know, even if it's just a, a couple hours a day, I'll probably install a ceramic heat emitter and see how it goes. Yeah, I used to be under the impression up until pretty recently, actually, that since green tree python eggs or python eggs in general seems to seem to do best around 86.5, 87, 87.5, somewhere in that area that, that the female would want to get that warm while she's gravid because they're basically incubating inside of her exactly for a couple months uh after she ovulates but but hearing you say that your retics don't get that warm and blood python breeders that keep ambient you know maybe they don't need to be that warm until after they're laid and like i said i've, I've seen my retics you know nearly three degrees warmer than the room temperature when they're gestating that's interesting uh, I, got, I I don't see the shivering. I don't see any of that. But they uh -huh. they they do raise their body temperature somehow. I, I've literally I could go through my phone. It probably took it a couple of years ago by first. But I I, I temped the back wall of the enclosure it was like eighty four point two or something, and then I temped the the lower part of the body of the retic that was under the you know the upper third. It was kind of the lower coil, um, and it was in the high eighty six. Hmm. Um, Dave, I do have a question to, to if we want to circle back to it. Um, sure. It's interesting because so I keep my room at 70 and my uh, hot spots during the day are between 83 to 85. Mm -hmm. Hot spots drop to around 78 and it's 12 and 12 year round. I don't mm -hmm. finagle with temperatures and I've had, um, you know, I've, I've had a, a couple clutches. Uh, on my third now waiting for this female to lay any day now. So my question to you is <clears throat> the fact that you do night drop year round and then you also finagle with temperatures when it gets a little bit cooler out. 
Have you noticed your females possibly develop in egg follicles or day hunting or hug on the cool side when you're not trying to cycle them? Have you noticed multiple times a year them acting differently like they, they do have follicles in them? Uh, I have had some what I would consider off-season clutches. I, I can't remember exactly when the females laid or when they hatched. I, I think hatched. Uh, October ish, so they're you know late a couple of months before that. So I've had, I think I've had three of those clutches. So it does happen. Most of my females lay between I don't know January and April. Um, but that wasn't your question. I guess you're asking about them developing follicles. Well, you kind of answered it because yeah, basically, have you have you just seen a female acting weird? in July and you just decided to toss a male in there with her and it worked. I don't know if it was, I paired them necessarily because of something I saw her doing. I think I just, you know, sometimes I say, what the hell, let's give it a shot and see. And then, um, it worked out. I don't know if I have the eye to see that sort of thing. An interesting observation that I, that I had recently was I, I'm getting, I'm getting ready to potentially keep these females in ambient conditions. So after I moved, so I actually started doing that now with some of my adults. And after turning off their heat panels, they're sitting exactly where they were when the heat panels were running. So it makes you wonder if they're really paying attention to that or they they're just like that. It. Yeah, it just seems like they just like sitting in that exact same spot in the cage. And it's not like it's all consistent. There's one in the back right. There's one in the front left. There's one in the front middle. And that's just where those snakes like to sit. So I don't, it's kind of weird. I, I was going to say every single one of my chondros that I have, I have, I think, uh, I don't know, two, six or seven. Every single one of them have their place. And again, I keep ambient, but they have their spot that they uh -huh. sit in 80% of the time. And the other 20% is when they're cruising around at night. <laughs> Yeah. Same exact spot. I, I can tell you, I'm not going to do it, but I could literally go through each of my animals and tell you where in that, that Cambro or in their enclosure that they sit and they're there almost I, like I would bet money on it that if you came into my garage, I could tell you where they'll be. You'll go in and I guarantee you I'll win. <laughs> yeah. It makes you wonder how much thermoregulating they're actually doing in the wild. It seems like they just endure whatever they're given. Maybe with the exception of a gravid female, or if it, a snake ate a really large prey at them, but I think they just they just chill, and you know they have a tolerance. There's a window where they're okay, so they don't necessarily worry about where they're sitting. It's not like they're a lizard that crawls out of the hole a hole every morning, and they have to heat up to operating temperature and sit in the sun for a few hours. Right. Yeah, I don't know if they act yeah. that way. It's almost like they're prioritizing safety over uh, thermoregulating sometimes. Mm -hmm. Wherever they right. feel like they're safe. Chill chondros, right? What was that? I said chill chondros, right? Yeah. Um, Dave, so do you Chuck, mind? Oh, go for it. Chuck, so you can, you, you can see day hunting and female swelling and sitting on the cool <laughs> side, and that's what's prompting you to pair your snakes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I went over how I keep them, but, uh, like I have a female that just laid, um, she laid in January. Mm -hmm. Uh, I hatched the clutch out in March and I will be repeat pairing her cause due to my notes, I'll be repeat pairing her, you know, second, uh, first, second week in September. But, um, you know, it, it looks like right around two to three times a year, two of my snakes now three times a year, they're, they're, acting like i would want them to act and i'm pairing this female in september and now it's july so all well yeah july so july august september mm -hmm. um she started a couple weeks ago she's on the cold side hunting like crazy mm -hmm. and she just laid in january but she's always under the heat panel and there's one certain perch i basically i have a, she's in a cambro and uh, I basically have um, two, like you said, two parallel perches going down the sides. Mm -hmm. And she's got every extreme. She's got the coldest corner, the hottest corner, and then everything in between. 
and she is now pinned on the coolest side. And at night, she comes down, goes underneath the, um, you know, the puppy pad, and she, this conjure water bowl wraps. I have pictures okay. of her wrapping oh. her around, and it's actually it's not a bowl; it's a um, it's a hatchling tote. That's her water bowl because it's a lot of okay. surface area, mm -hmm. and she she wraps that sometimes during the middle of the day but right now she's hunting like crazy i come in the room she's off the perch ready to eat now a, a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago she wanted nothing to do with me she would just tuck her head and be tucked in the back corner under the heat but now she's all the way at the front the coolest side so i'm, sh I'm sure I, if i could if i wanted to push the envelope i could throw a mail in there and see what happened but i don't want to do that. I'm going to, you know, I pair on doing it or plan on pairing her in September. So I just want to wait, but yeah, she'll go back to the heat probably in a couple of weeks. It's pretty neat to see. Um, I don't see a swell in her yet, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's the, 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 the way she's acting is exactly the way she was acting before I paired and, and successfully bred her. I don't know if you've ever looked at Rico's old website, but if you use the internet archive, you can, a lot of it's broken and you can't see a lot of the pictures, but you can see he got clutches almost every month of the year. Probably, he probably did get one every month of the year over the course of his keeping them. But he had an ultrasound at least during the last several years. And that's how he was pairing them. I, I have an ultrasound, but I just don't use it, but I, I might start that too. After I move, after I get someone to help me because I've tried it, it's kind of a pain in the ass to do by yourself. Yeah. Right. And and, and most of um, I, I've modeled a majority of my stuff uh, uh, after Socrates and Patrick Holmes, and mm -hmm. they have they they breed year round, and, and mm -hmm. that's how they do it. Year round night drop. Um, I don't know necessarily Pat specifics, but I know Socrates doesn't do more than a one degree night drop if he even does that, and he just watches them how mm -hmm. they act, and they kind of tell when they're ready. That's the big thing of switching to ambient that I noticed with my my retics is um, it was a, a big like learning curve of how to identify behavior because when you keep on a gradient style you know you'll see the the animal move over to the cool side uh food response will increase and that that lets you know ah follicular development right and then when you start to see a decrease in their food response you know that they're getting close you could start doing introductions um but with ambient um you don't get that luxury of like that cool side and so you have to pay a lot more attention to their their behaviors and their cues and how they're responding when you open the enclosure and um you know pacing things like that so there's different behaviors to look out for with the different type of setups in my opinion yeah and dave i have a i have a significantly smaller collection than you so it's 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 much easier for me to watch one female yeah yeah it is <laughs> Rather than it having a hundred snake, a hundred enclosures to uh, you know peer into, right? Yeah, well, maybe that's the problem. But for me, it seems like they're always very eager to eat. So I don't know what extra hungry looks like. You know, they're just they're it's, always down. I don't it's see a lot the of puppy problems. pads and balls at night, and that the females are just. It's almost like they grow legs and they just start moving. Mm -hmm. And like I said, water bowl wrap, and I have pictures of it. It's the weirdest thing. She looks like a ball python. She's yeah, wrapped. I think I've ever seen that with a it's with a crazy. Condor. Yeah. I got to get the picture and send it to you. Uh, I had a male do that when he was he was basically dying. Um, mm. I gave him antibiotics and he bounced back, but he had some kind of medical issue. He was wrapping around the bowl. Interesting. Um, Dave, if you don't mind, we're talking about breeding and cycling. Can you dumb it down one hundred and one? For the new guy over here that's asking you the question, but like, um, what are you doing to cycle your your females? And I guess more specifically, um, let's start with like first time females. Like, let's say they're five years old or four years old with weight, or maybe six years old. But like, what are you what are you doing to get them to cycle? Well, to start with it. Don't know if I bred a female that was four. I generally wait till they're five or older. I have enough that I just yeah. I forget about them. And by the time I remember to breed them, they're, they're big and they're old. They also seem to grow a lot for me between four and five. They're probably only five or 600 grams when they're four. But by the time they're five, they're maybe 800 grams. So that's a good reason to wait. Um, and then as far as what I do to get them to cycle, 
Mostly just the night drop. I'm probably going to try the food cycle thing just because other people have had success with them. But in the past, I've fed them pretty consistently year round and just waited until October or so. What is that? What is that feeding regimen like? Uh, for adult females, I, I switched to rats several years ago. I used to only feed mice because that was a cool thing to do, but now I only feed my females rats and, and, uh, the occasional ASF. Um, and I wouldn't say it's every three weeks. It's not that regimented, but that's probably a good average every three weeks. If a female looks fat, then I'll feed her a little less. And if a female looks like she needs a little extra, I might feed her a little more. I feed uh, mostly small rats. And then I get a lot of my rodents from Lane Labs. And they have a rat size called small, medium. So I, I get some of those too. And then my males, probably the same frequency, but I only feed them mice. My males are all pretty small. They're all about 400 grams. Okay. So now going into back into the cycling. So you are, you're doing the temp drops. Um, Mm -hmm. what, when, when things are going well as expected and, you know, are you looking for something to start the introduction or are you just like, when you start to do the drops is when you start to do the intros or I guess what changes in your observation when you do the, the drops? Yeah. Once I start cooling them, that's when I start pairing. Okay. And then I just check the next morning and see who's locked up. And then maybe the following morning I'll do the same. And if I don't see the male doing anything, I might pull them for a couple weeks okay. and then try again. Do you ever then, utilize misting? I, I know um, you told me you don't miss, but have you ever utilized misting for breeding behavior? Like if you have a storm from coming in, like introduce them and spray them down? No, I haven't. I hear people talking about that. Maybe you can, and, and also things like using the shed of a male or whatever to get a snake to breed. But I, I feel like, and I think I heard Patrick say that this isn't true. But um, I feel like if you're if you're gonna try to do something to stimulate them to breed, it might not be a productive breeding because the female doesn't have anything going on. I think for the most part if the female's developing follicles, the male is going to want to breed or maybe you need to, maybe you need to try a different male, but um, yeah, I don't know if, if there's a storm or something and she's not developing follicles, who, who cares if they breed? <clears throat> it's fair. Right. And what, what time of the year does that temp drop start for you? Um, I, know, I know that's going to vary for people around the country, but I'm just curious where you're at about what month or so are you starting that process? Uh, September, or October. Okay. Yeah. My, it's, it's interesting seeing when people get clutches, but mine are, my, my snakes generally breed between September and December. And then after that, they're not going to breed unless I get one of those late pairings and uh, John Irby and Brad Fisher and I are close friends and we message each other every day. And uh, we are talking about how in, in the winter, your snake room drops obviously because it's cold outside. But right now, if you're keeping in the basement, it's also probably pretty cold in your house because your air conditioner is running nonstop and people have mechanical rooms in their basements that may be near their snake room. So I think that's why we, we kind of, in our collections, we have kind of two clusters when we're seeing females develop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, one thing I noticed with me being on ambient is, uh, you know, even though it's cooler, on average during the winter in my garage, I notice that a lot of my, my retics will cycle when it gets hotter and I cycle and turn the AC on because instead of hot air being blown out of the mini split, it's now cool air being blown out. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's interesting you say that. Yeah. So cycling, um, I, I mean, it, what, okay. So now, now you've cycled, um, you, you doing your, maybe given a female more, uh, what are you doing once you see an ovulation? 
Uh, pulling, yeah. pulling, pulling the mail out. Okay. Um, lay box. Uh, when are you pulling perches? Are you swapping out a smaller water bowl? Are you pulling the water bowl? Are you stuffing her in a rack? I, I like it. Sounds so rude. <laughs> I like you stuffing rack. her in a rack. I haven't tried that yet, but I, I'll probably do that in the future. I'd like to get a rack specifically for that purpose. Probably a. Uh, it seems like a genius idea, man. <clears throat> yeah, it's nice and secure. Uh, you can get the temperatures dialed in. You don't have to worry about them crawling around. I've had a lot of females where I haven't pulled the perches yet because I still know they're a week or two away from laying, but they're restless. So they're crawling all over their cage and you can hear them falling everywhere. And you know, that's not Jeez. good for the eggs. So putting that's, them in a rack in that situation would be good. That's what I'm experiencing right now. So I have a Wi-Fi camera in mine and she's just grown legs and is going insane <laughs> pushing all the sphagnum moss into the small water bowl but what i do is i have a uh, i have a, a a log with a wi-fi camera on it so i could see her and then uh -huh. i also have a camera on the cage but I, I i run a heat pad underneath of that lay log with a thermostat probe on the heat pad itself and then a goby receiver inside of the egg box and before i let her in i put like a little mesh thing on it so i can get some air exchange so i get a proper temperature and I pull the perches, but I'll make sure it's about 82 to 84 degrees inside the lay box. And then I pull the screen. And now I know for a fact, like it's got its own thermostat. The lay logs right over this heat pad that has its own thermostat that won't burn her up. It's basically like heat tape, but on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I'm using. I mean, she could Chuck, spread are them you, all are over you, the are you Are you putting that care. directly inside the cage? Like the, 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 the uh, heat pad, no. The heat. Okay. It, I pick up the whole PVC enclosure. I slide the heat pad and the probe under, and then I put. Right now, I have squeegees for tint on either side, so that it doesn't like really crush the probe from the thermostat. Kind of yeah. gives it a little bit of a you know a lip. And yeah, I got the thermostat set to like ninety one or ninety two, and that gives me about eighty one to eighty three to maybe eighty four inside of the uh, lay log. Nice. What is what is the screen for to keep her from going under the log before you have the temp styled in? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah, because I, I use the same the same lay log, the same heat pad, and the same VE thermostat because I hate VE. So the only thing I use the VE for is the lay log. I use all herp stat <laughs> stuff because I like the one tenth of a degree adjustments, and I don't mm -hmm. have to buy the expensive model to get night drop in it. Um, but yeah, I, I but I'm using it in a PVC enclosure. And then uh, the next day I'll, you know, or the next clutch, I'll convert the log to fit into a 26, 18, 16 Cambro. And that's obviously much different temperatures trying to get that heat pad to go through the Cambro tub and get the proper temperature in the lay log. Mm -hmm. It's nice. It's got a, it, like I said, it's got a camera in it. And you know, when I turn the notifications mm -hmm. on, when she gets close, Every single time she moves, it sends me a notification. So it's I, I just get a text message. I click on it and I go right to the app and I can watch whatever events happening. Whether she's doing that crazy pushing, do you ever see them like they push their face in every corner and they do that thing with their head where they shake, trying to like basically rub their scales off their face? Oh, that's a retake they, thing, man. You, they'll do that for fun. They start panicking, man. When they start just losing their shit, when they know it's, it's coming. stressful. Yeah. Um. Real quick, um, I want to backtrack. Um, introductions. So, like, when you're introducing the male with the female, um, are you just uh, – how are you mitigating feed response? How are you doing that safely? Um, and I, I ask that, again, selfishly because I, my first pairing is going to be a import pair of a ruse, um, and both of them um, are insane with feeding responses, and both of them hate – just being removed from enclosures. So I'm dealing with two animals that just don't like me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, like most people, I always put the male on the females enclosure. If you're going to stress one of them out, it should be the male. Also, it's probably more akin to what they're experiencing in the wild males cru cruise around and find a female. So I always put the male on the females enclosure. Generally do that during the day. And um, you'd be surprised that some of these bitchy females once once they sense that there's a male in there even if he's a third of their size their attitude changes big time i have had some females bite males i think it was a feeding response normally when that happens 
they recognize immediately that it's not food and I'll just let go. Uh, there have been a couple of times where the, the female wrapped the male and I had to pull them apart. Um, yeah, I think I listened to, I think your last show, you talked about this uh, misting. You can miss them if they're kind of bitey, or I think someone else said you can, you can remove the female and put her back in her cage. Once she's crawling around, she's less apt to, to bite, but it doesn't seem to be that big a deal. Uh, I think generally I'll have a, a hook. So if I, I'm holding the male in this hand and then I got the hook. And if I see the female raise her head, like she's looking for food, I'll tap her on the head and normally she'll pull it back into her coils. And then, you know, you just, just put the male in there and shut the door and you're good. Cool. Awesome. There you go. <laughs> she's losing her shit. She's in the egg box right now. <laughs> she's awesome. she's yeah she's totally screwing the shot up but yeah i mean once she goes back down she's just in she's just in the egg box or that's pretty box, awesome yeah so she's under the hide in her cage yeah um man she's really screwing the shot up but yeah this is uh this is the outside of her cage and that's the lay log with the camera on top did she voluntarily cho choose to go inside of it yeah, she's been in and out for the last probably week now. She's, I think I'm, I forget, I think I'm 17 or 18 days post shed. Mm -hmm. Day maybe 45 or something like that post ovulation. Yeah, and she's doing the pushing thing. She's trying to push the friggin' top of it right now. She's like shaking her head. That's so, what I was, that's what I was seeing when you showed the camera. Yeah, she's, she's absolutely losing her shit right now, trying to push. So, well, that's interesting because I, I obviously don't have a camera like that, but I would have guessed that once they go in a nest box like that, that they would settle down. I guess I have had females go in and then come out. The, the first clutch I got out of her, um, she was in a different box. It was a box that time, but mm -hmm. I have pictures of me at 11. It was like 1130 PM the night prior of her sitting on top basking under, you know, the top of the lay box underneath the, the, the panel just hanging outside. Mm -hmm. And then six 30 in the morning, I'm leaving for work and she had almost the entire clutch out inside the egg box hmm. or lay box. Excuse me. Jeez. Yeah. I'll tell you what I, what I, I have done and what I do now. Uh, in the past, I used to use these Rubbermaid containers. I think they're three gallons and then just get a hole saw and cut a, a nice hole in the top. And you want to use a, hole saw that's big enough for the snake it's basically twice the diameter of a snake because if you use a hole that's only slightly larger than the diameter of the snake there's a risk that the snake will double back and mm -hmm. get get lodged in there and potentially kill itself so you need a pretty big hole saw for that i started out using sphagnum moss uh i've had females lay in bear nest boxes which is kind of my preference because I think it makes it easier to for them to gather the eggs in their coils and you don't have to worry about them getting moss stuck in their heat pits, but they don't always like that. Um, and then, so I've also, some people use towels, I use paper towels, but in the past few years, I started ordering these pine, I guess they're unfinished jewelry boxes off of Amazon. So they're probably about 10 inches wide, eight inches deep and five or six inches high. And they have a, they have a latch on the front and then they hinge to the back. Mm -hmm. And I use a hole, hole saw and cut a hole in that. But, um, I like those. But you got to go in reverse. Got, no, I, I don't do that. I got, I, I do. Const oh, I did construction. So you got to go in reverse. Cause if not, I would, do, well, I, yeah, I, before I knew what the hell I was doing, I tried it in forward and just it was like an explosion. There was just plastic everywhere. Oh, just, okay. Oh, okay. It just grabbed. Yeah. Yeah. You cut siding in reverse with a hole saw when you're cutting through like house siding. So I just started cutting in reverse. It melts it. Yeah, I was cutting a hole with the hole saw and uh it it bit into what I forget what I was even doing. I think it was plastic. And it bit into the plastic and it kicked back and I it cut my hand pretty bad. So you gotta be careful when you're messing with those things. Yes, but, um, disclaimer, do not sue us, cut in reverse. Yeah. 
So about 10 days after they have their prelay shed is when I'll, I might put a nest box in a little earlier than that. Okay. I'll, so uh, maybe after at the time of their prelay shed, that's when I'll put the nest box in there. If they haven't settled in, then that's about the time when I'm pulling their perch. And if they don't settle in within a couple days of doing that, maybe 12 days post prelay shed, then I'm going to I put a glass baking dish or something over that hole in the nest box and I, I lock them in there. And um, that works pretty well because obviously you don't have to worry about them hurting themselves mm. or laying in a, the eggs in water or anything like that. Um, Jeez, that sounds like a nightmare. I didn't even think of that, laying eggs in water. But if you keep a large enough water dish, I'm sure it's possible. Yeah, it happens. They'll lay from the perch. They'll drop them in water. <laughs> I've, I've only had one female lay from the perch, and that's, that's really a stupid way to ruin a clutch of eggs. But uh, the, it happened with this particular female because she laid 13 days post prelay shed, which was very early for me. I think I was, I was planning on locking her in the following day. I kind of thought 14 days was kind of the lower end of the range, but no, I, they can lay 12 or 13 days post prelay shed. Dave, so I, Dave, I, Dave I, that, that, that was, that was, that had to be a 30, like late thirties post ovulation. That wasn't even day 40, was it? Uh, I think it was, I don't think I've ever had a female lay prior to day 40. Post okay, so it was just should, longer before her shed. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And and the general consensus in the community now is it's it's more precise, surprisingly, to pay attention to the time from ovulation delay versus shed delay. The shed shed delay can be more variable. But um just I'd say err on the side of caution and take the perches out early. Yeah. The one thing I tried this season was uh, instead of using that, I forgot to mention what I put in those pine boxes, but I, I normally uh, fold up several layers of paper towel, and shove it in there. But uh, I saw Patrick Holmes use little leaves. Uh, I don't know what kind of leaves they are, but I got some for like a bioactive setup. I have some geckos. So I just had these leaves on the shelves sitting around for several months. And I put those in a nest box this year, and the female went right in. So I don't know if that smelled more natural. Maybe she would have gone in if there was nothing in that box. But that's something I'm going to try again. Nice. Keep us posted. Yeah. Um. So, I guess my next question is: is we so they're they're in the lay box? They lay the eggs. Um, you know, do you typically? Cl- keep the clutch together are you pulling them and separating them um and um you know i'm sure chuck can go into detail about oh she's chill now what i've noticed uh, sorry to interrupt what i've noticed is now she's starting to do like this labored breathing and it looks mm-hmm. like I, i'd imagine probably by the end of the week you could just see like she'll just do a big gasp every you know every few seconds or whatever but yeah. hopefully yeah, she chills man um, yeah, so do you know? Do you know how many days post ovulation and post shed she is? She ovulated on May thirtieth, and she, uh, June twenty fifth was the shed. So she's she was twenty six days post ovulation on um, June twenty fifth, and then let's see okay so post ovulation is one two three four five six so she's it's on 42 43 she's 44. On day, yeah she's on day 44 right now 44 mm-hmm. 45 post ovulation but she lays late it's every snake here just decides to lay late as shit it's well, i think that's because of your caps. yeah correct yep yeah. and my my clutches don't hatch out for like till day 54 55 mm-hmm. yeah there was someone uh in the green tree one of the forums and he had a female lay, I think it was 37 days post ovulation. Damn. I made a comment and he's like, well, I said that was unusual. And he, he said it wasn't, but I found out that he had um, provided heat at night. So that's the difference. If you provide full heat at night, it's going to mm-hmm. be a lot. Yeah. Sooner. 
I pulled the perches very early, so that's yeah. a, to prevent any issues. I mean, I, I rather them lay seven days later than what they're supposed to in a good clutch than drop them into a water bowl 37 days after they ovulated. Dude, mm -hmm. that sounds <laughs> dumb. Um, it happens a lot. It's that's crazy fairly often. Me. Yeah. And some people are like, oh, it doesn't hurt the eggs. And it hurts some of them. Some of them hatch. A lot of them don't. Yeah. I mean, I just, I guess when I say dumb, I'm just thinking in my head, like it's dumb. I feel like they, they, it, they, it hurts they, if I fall 24 they, inches, I'm 35 like, years old. If I fall 24 inches, I ain't getting back up very quickly. I just, I, I'm just wondering like what is going through there? Like how do they survive? Um, but I guess we're putting them in a box, so it's kind of unfair to make that statement. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's talk about pulling eggs, separating and incubation. Um, you know, substrate medium um and uh all that good stuff okay yeah uh once they lay if i know right when the when the female stopped laying i might wait an hour or two to pull the eggs just so they can dry and the, the calcium can not be opaque anymore you don't want to put wet eggs in an incubator it's a good way to get wet spots so i'll wait an hour or two if i know when she stopped Otherwise, I'll just take her, take them from her right away, and I separate them when I can. Sometimes, sometimes you can't separate them, um, or you can't separate all of them. Maybe you can separate all but a few, so I'll leave a little cluster together. I've incubated uh, using the no substrate method over water, and also really wet vermiculite and really wet perlite and i've also incubated directly on vermiculite and i think that's going to be my go-to at least for the time being is to put them directly on vermiculite just seems to regulate their moisture content better yeah yeah i put my eggs in again not chondra specific I, but um I put them directly on perlite and I feel like perlite vermiculite. It's just a matter of preference. They both succeed and do the same thing. I like the air exchange with the perlite mm -hmm. better. It's not as dense. Um, but, but yeah, I was thinking if I was going to do that and go that method and just, you know, do it what I do with the other eggs that I hatch and just put the eggs directly on the perlite. Yeah. I've never tried that with perlite, but I've seen some people incubate Python eggs with perlite and what they'll do is they'll, they'll have the, moist or wet perlite on the bottom and then they'll add another layer of dry perlite on top and put the eggs directly on that and if you think about it that's almost like no substrate in a way because they're not touching anything moist right it's they're, right. they're suspended over the moist medium but they're just yeah held in place yeah i mean what i do with the perlite is just add water to it until when i you know i grab it and clump it together that you know it clumps and but there's no water dripping out of it um mm -hmm. it's just kind of an eyeball thing that i've done but definitely want to stay away from too moist yeah i mix vermiculite by weight um one to one water to vermiculite by mm -hmm. weight or maybe even a little bit drier i've heard of people i've heard that if you do that trick with vermiculite and chondro eggs it's going to be too wet okay if probably you if you mix it by weight, it you almost can't even detect the water in there. It's how, how dry it is. Okay. Yeah, I might give that a shot. Yeah. What's your uh, egg box or your egg box inside of the incubator? I, I get actually, I guess it doesn't even matter because you're going directly to vermiculite, so it doesn't even matter what you're using. To be honest with you. Well, I mean, yeah, size not. size matters. Um, well, yeah, but that's what she said. But size matters. <laughs> um, yeah, I use uh, large SIM containers, and I also use a uh, Sterilite container. I think it's 12 quarts. So they're they're pretty similar size. The Sterilite is probably not as tall, but it's wider. Gotcha. And you, do you have a uh, humidified chamber in your incubator? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I, I have a Forma lab incubator. That's my main humidifier. And it holds humidity really well. This year, I tried a couple of clutches with uh, what's it called? Hot box. I have a hot box, so I mess with that. Uh, either way, I humidify the chamber with a couple pans of water, and I like to keep 
air holes open in my egg boxes during the uh, entire incubation. But I did find this being my first time using a hot box that the water in those pans evaporated a lot more quickly than I was expecting. So are you, you I, 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 I do follow you closely. So you've mentioned in the past that you use a water jacketed incubator. Uh -huh. Was that a, was that a lab incubator that you were using prior, and then you switched to the uh, hot box, or do you have a water jacket that goes over your hot box? No, no, that's the Forma. That's still my main incubator. I just okay. bought a hot box. Just, just I don't know why I've never heard of that before. A water jacketed incubator. Yeah, um, it's, it's what they use in labs to grow bacterial cultures and things like that. So it's super stable. So. The, the walls of the incubator are, are, are hollow and it's, it's, um, it holds 11 gallons of water in the walls of the incubator. So it's uh, thermally stable and that's where the heat comes from. The water is heated. So there's really almost zero gradient from top to bottom. And then the front door, there's an insulated door that's about three inches thick. And you open that up and then behind that is a glass door and that glass door is heated. So you don't get condensation on the front either. So damn, where do you find one of these? Uh, the company is called Forma Scientific. Okay. That sounds badass. Yeah. Christian Stewart used to use one, but he couldn't get it into his new, uh, where, he, where he moved to. So he's using a hot box. So, Thomas man, Parkway so, also got one. You can get them used for a lot cheaper when labs are getting new equipment. They're heavy as shit, though. It weighs, I think, 300 pounds before you put 11 gallons of water in it. And, you know, a gallon is eight pounds. So it weighs close to 400 pounds when it's full. Holy oh, shit. Wow. Wow. Uh, is there a, a fan in it? Yeah. Hmm. That's pretty awesome. Um, so, and those don't function with any heat tape? No, it has a... That's awesome. It has a built-in... I don't know what the heat element is, but it's it's built in there. Okay, what's, it's built in the thermostat? thermostat? Yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah, it's all in there. There's, there's a little digital screen on the front, and you can actually... I don't have the sensor for it, but you can you can have it control the CO2 inside of there also, if you were so inclined. Man. That sounds like right up Chuck's alley. Like if Chuck can control any variable or any molecule possible in the breeding process, that sounds like Chuck. He busts my balls because of this heat, this, this temperature gun I have. He busts my balls so bad. He's got a temp gun that basically is taking x-rays of his snakes. It, it's a Teledyne FLIR thermal imaging camera. But it's exactly. exactly. Has that paid off? Have you made any observations that you wouldn't have otherwise? Honestly, with the snakes, I don't think so. But with my house, oh my god, man! I found leaks behind walls. Behind you could see behind drywall with it because you could see what the temperature is of everything. Mm -hmm. It's incredible and FLIR. F -L F -L -I -R. FLIR is what they use. Uh, uh, my main career is I'm, I'm a police officer. I work for the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So like the, the state or the state police helicopter that I ride in has a, a FLIR thermal imaging camera on the front of it. And it's, it's basically, it's the exact same company. It's incredible. Well, Lu Lucas was talking about having females that were warmer than the ambient temperature. So I don't know if you'd be able to see that. That would be cool. A hundred percent. You yeah. would 100%. And if the eggs inside of her, her were warmer than her, you could see basically, I mean, depending on how much fat and skin is there, you would be able to see if the, if the eggs made a thermal image on the skin of the animal that was warmer than say the, the head or the neck, uh -huh. you would see a warmer image on it. As long as it touched the surface, whatever's on the surface is what you see. Don't don't get me wrong. I give him shit for it, but I want one. <laughs> yeah, it sounds cool. But you haven't seen that, Chuck. You haven't seen the ascent of the female be blue versus green or whatever. 
you know what? I haven't tried it, but I have a yeah. perfect test subject upstairs that I will try it with tomorrow. Yeah, to be dude. If she is not moving and she is in that egg box, do not touch shit. <laughs> <laughs> I could just stick the gun. It's a, it's a little. I and I could just click the trigger and I could just take pictures. I don't even have to like take live. I could just stick it in there and take pictures. But that's pretty damn cool. Um, I, I'm gonna start going on eBay and looking for some of these used incubators. Um, yeah, they, they're um, they pique my interest. Yeah, also look for Thermo Fisher. I can't remember if Forma is a product line or vice versa but look for forma or thermal fisher Tom, okay. Tom, thomas budway has one too i think i can't remember if i already mentioned that but they're, they're pretty sweet yeah the ones that i'm looking at here that are used i'm seeing um yeah thermo scientific forma uh mm-hmm. hermo slash forma um the newer ones look cool these older ones look um uh, like they're they're like a beige color almost looks like a freezer chest yeah that's kind of what mine looks like that's not beige though cool what are the prices you're seeing lucas uh this one is but well, that's see that's where it's gonna bite you in the ass like these i'm finding used for 800 bucks but it's almost a thousand dollars to ship uh, because my, of, because my, because of how heavy they are that's nothing my wife's numb to that shit <laughs> we're good no well, i mean what, I, what the, you have to do is convince yourself that it's a worthwhile investment if you're breeding snakes that you're selling for thousands of dollars and you feel you can yeah. convince oh. yourself that you're going to have one extra egg oh right exactly it pays for in one year um uh-huh. you know because i i went with like a sea serpent hot box type right like it's a pvc build and uh prior to that i was using one that i made out of one of those like gas station uh refrigerators and um i'm still using the PVC one because it's in my garage. The other one is still upstairs and I want to move this fridge downstairs, but, um, I, I don't like it. Um, it just, it's not as stable as, as the one that I built myself. Um, and so I am very open and looking for a replacement. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that I didn't like about the hot box is just the vertical gradient. Because I think I could get away with two clutches in it. I could fit a third, but I think it would it would be too cold at the top. Otherwise, if it was if I were able to get it warm enough on the top shelf, then it would be uh, too warm. Warm on the bottom. Isn't yeah. it weird how that how it's cooler up top? You get like I get like a one degree swing on the bottom. Yeah, because the heat blows out of the bottom. And, yep. and one thing that I've noticed is keeping ambient temperatures when I have my daily fluctuations is you, you can see, you know, the, the sensor push system that I have inside of the incubator to measure the ambient temp in there. Um, you see the increase and decrease with the, the ambient temperature in the garage. Um, it doesn't fluctuate like dramatically, but I just, I don't like seeing that. Um, well, I think when females incubate in, in the wild, they leave their eggs and they probably also get them a lot warm. I think they could probably get them up to 90 or so, but mm-hmm. then they're not sitting on them all the time. Yeah. They let them breathe. Yeah. So fluctuations um, aren't necessarily a bad thing, but I say you know, that my incubator doesn't fluctuate at all. Well, I was going to say, because I mean, I, I've talked to, to, you know, Bill and I've talked to a few other people and they swear that, you know, if your incubator is fluctuating, you know, within more, th- more than a degree in a daily period, it's just a recipe that doesn't work out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm Chuck, you got any other incubation substrate medium questions before we kind of wrap up the breeding aspect with, um, well, we talked a little bit about Neo establishment before, but uh, if you had any more questions to ask on that. I do. Uh, basically, it's it's simple. What are your incubation temps? And um, what are you doing at day 40 to 50 if you're dropping anything? And how many, you know, how many days are your incubations typically before you're getting your first pip? Okay. I... Uh, I mix it up a little bit, but anywhere between 87 and 87.5. And I just do a straight bake. 
a lot of the times I'll have more than one clutch incubating. That's why I don't, that's why I don't back off the, the final 10 days or so. Rico was one of the first people that I know of that switched to um, the straight bake versus the, the old method it was called 151 where they would, and it's in Greg Maxwell's book. The first week is, is warm. Actually, the first week is cool. The next five weeks are a little bit warmer and then you cool again for the last week. And, and he was getting 49 day uh, incubation. So that fit nicely into the 151 thing. But Rico had a bunch of clutches going on at once. So he just figured out, well, you can just keep them a constant temperature and they're fine. And I believe he used to incubate his eggs at 88 degrees and they were okay. But, but since then people have turned their temps down a little bit, you have more of a margin for error because I don't know what that maximum is that eggs can sustain, but I don't think it's a lot higher than 88. It might be 89. So yeah, 87 to 87.5 is what I do, and I keep them uh, the same throughout incubation. I can't remember what else you asked related to that. Uh, what what day are your pips typically if you're when you're cooking like that? Uh, 52 to 54. And you, what do you do as far as um, when you see your first pip? You know, when are you when are you cutting if you cut it all? Yeah, I feel like for a lot of these questions, I don't really have concrete answers just because i'm the type of person who fucks with things a lot i'm always <laughs> anchoring and that's probably bit me in the ass more than it's helped me so some sometimes most of the time i'll cut um a few hours after one's pipped there have been some clutches that just look like the eggs were nice and soft and all the babies i let pip themselves um so part of it is it's based on how many clutches i have incubating uh, how many <clears throat> eggs are in that particular clutch. Like if it's small, you're probably, you want to get what you can get. So I would be more likely to intervene and pip them. And also how the eggs look. I've had some clutches where the shells looked really thick. They were over calcified and they had little calcium dimples all over them too. So, mm -hmm. uh, and also maybe the method I'm using to incubate them, whether that's suspended over water, they might be a little drier than if they're directly on vermiculite. And that's one of the reasons why I like incubating on vermiculite. It seems to keep the shells softer. Okay. One thing that I do that might be different than uh, some other people is I don't put little perches in the hatch tubs for the snakes to climb on after they emerge. I just think it's a lot easier to pull them out if I'm not removing them from a perch. Dude, taking a freaking young chondra off a perch is a pain in the ass. I can imagine doing it with a bunch of brand new babies that are freaking the size of your thumb. Yeah, they're also, um, they're not really firmed up yet, if you know what I mean. They're kind of, they're kind of limp. <laughs> they don't have a lot of muscle tone. So they're, they're extra delicate. So yeah. I just, you might you might not want to wait too long like i'll 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 emerge them as sorry i'll remove them as they emerge a few at a time because otherwise they have a tendency to sit on each other and they could sit on top of eggs that haven't pipped yet which you know could, could be problematic for that particular egg chuck do you put something in there yeah yeah, I, uh, I I have a perch in there, and I let them come out. But I, I Mark Hager said, "I'm fucking scissor happy. I just cut everything." <laughs> mm, fair enough. <laughs> just go in there and just start chopping shit up. I yeah. I, I mean, I cut one out. <clears throat> uh, Dave, I I don't know if you've ever heard of this. I I have never heard of it, but um, one of my previous uh, my previous clutch, I had uh, a baby come out, and it was doing that weird jerky motion, like a quarter of the way out. And I didn't know what that was. And obviously it was a, it was tied up in its umbilical cord mm -hmm. and it just freaked me the hell out. So what I did was this time is I took, um, shot glasses and I put them into my incubator and I saw one that I thought might be doing it. And it was just kind of like the fail safe. And I said, you know, if they can hatch a chicken in a plastic bag from 
you know, the, the second it was fertilized, maybe I could do the same with a green tree. So basically <clears throat> it looked like it was tied up, cut the snake out. It wasn't, but it had a huge yolk sack. So I took the snake with the yolk sack. I put it inside of a WWF shot glass with a couple drops of distilled water and it soaked up the yolk for like a day and a half. And I still have the snake and it's fine. It's, it's like an art artificial egg that won't tip over. Right. I wonder why it was acting that way. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I was just, you know, kind of like a helicopter parent looking at it. But. No, I have had them tie themselves up. I had a couple this year, and I think one of them, one of them made it, and the other one didn't. But that that umbilical cord gets, can get super tight, and it just mm -hmm. traps their strength. I yeah. I figure, what what the hell do I have to lose if it's it's not a it's not an egg anymore? It's a snake in an egg. So if I just yeah. put it in an artificial egg. And I make sure that it doesn't get tied up. Uh, what the fuck? I mean, what, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. It worked. Yeah, I'm almost wondering if it was trying to get out, but maybe the umbilical cord was too thick and it had too much yolk sac. It was kind of weighing it down. I don't know. I, I really, I don't know that I'll ever know. All I know is that it's alive. Thank God. Yeah. I'm dead. Shout out to WWF. <laughs> um, WWE now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is the old like. Yeah. Oh, God. 2006, I think I got that shot. Good old Those World Wrestling, Wrestling Federation. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Take us home with your. Um, so you are you suspending? Are you suspending them in their own individual tub over water? Are you putting paper towel? Are you what are you, what are you doing with them? And then you know after their first shed, how long are you waiting until your feeding trials? I put them each in their own tub immediately after I removed them from the egg box. And I use saturated paper towels as substrate. The perches I use were machined out of sheets of HDPE. So they're, they're basically little ladders with two rungs that just lean you know, the, from one corner to the top of the other side. Um, I like those because I can sterilize them in a dishwasher versus a lot of the 3D printed stuff. It's made of that PLA stuff. It, it melts, but yeah. HDPE is, is tough. Is the rod the same thing? Because there's tubular rods, right, that connect to that ladder? Or is it all, like, edged? Uh, no, mine, mine were machined out of – they're one piece. There's no connection. I had them made by a local plastic shop. Okay, so that tiny little Neo – because I, I, everyone's always concerned about the diameter of the perch. So mm -hmm. the perches are actually sitting on are not rounded or they're, they're edged like square or triangular. They're rounded. Oh, they are rounded. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess I'd have to see a picture of it to, to kind of, I guess I'm not getting, I'm, I'm think, thinking of David think of Brown, a ladder. So has. Think, think, think of a ladder okay. and then the bottom legs are sitting at the base of a corner and then it's, it's, it's like leaning sideways up to the top. Right. So the, so the rungs are tubular HDPE. Yeah, the whole thing is it's one piece. Yeah, they I'd have to round it off the corners. Yeah, I'll send you a picture. That's, yeah, that's, I'm interested. That's real cool. And I, I got a a buddy of mine that does um, Heli Guy Serpents. He does um, perches, and he's he, the plastic he uses is uh, ABS, so extremely like you can wash them and it's good to go. I guess I'm so. Cool. Yeah, 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 he 3D prints them. Okay. Yeah, heliguyserpent.com. He makes Condro purchase. He's he does a bunch of shit. He's innovating and making some really cool stuff. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that for interrupting. Yeah, I was just confused because I know all the HDPE stuff that I've seen is cut out of like a flat sheet almost with like a CNC machine. So that's why I was confused about the tubular. Um, mm. purchase yeah david's david's made me some stuff that way and he he is able to round the top part as it's laying down in the cutter but then there are corners on the on the underside but this plastic shop and i had it made it's probably 10 years ago they they rounded all of, all, all the corners still That's the it. same ones from 10 years yeah damn that shit's like indestructible, dude. That's like the that's plastic. Awesome. That's better than the plastic they use on AR-15s. Jeez. 
I mean, I yeah, I got, I'm into rifles and I'm on the tack team and stuff, and that's way stronger than the shit that's on my state rifle. <laughs> yeah. They make cutting boards out of it, and that's what milk jugs are. Okay. Laundry detergent jugs are HDPE. That's what vision cages are made out of. That's why I recognize it. <clears throat> um, so they shed. Yep. And I keep getting fe- off track here. Yeah, that's okay. I like I like the the sidebar conversations. That's what makes these not monotonous and and boring. Mon- Did I say? You said monotonous. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I, for some reason, my head. It went to monogamy. Um, Monogamous. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, yeah, so when are you feeding them or uh, offering? I, yeah, I, I have fed a few prior to them shedding, but it seems like they go from being super delicate to in shed. And I, so, don't want to mess with them the first four days or whatever, because they're still absorbing their yolk and figuring out what life is. And then the next thing you know, they're opaque. So there isn't really, I don't think there's a great window for feeding them prior to their first shed. And I don't really see a big reason to do that anyway. So normally I'll try the night after their first shed. Like I'll go, I'll go in there in the morning and I'll see that this one, this one, this one, and this one shed. So that (laughs) night I'll go in there and try and feed them. What do you do with the ones that don't shed for 30 days? I'm sure you've had they, a couple. They skip that first shed. Uh, I don't know if I've had that. Okay. If I did, I would try feeding them. If they didn't, if they weren't opaque and all the others had shed, I would, I would, wouldn't wait. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if anybody ever goes based off of just observation, right? Cause I mean, you, you can, you could see a you know fresh neo perch and it's just sitting there and then you can see when they kind of start to you know a little bit of coddle luring or they have that head down roosting a little bit mm-hmm. um you know because i hear a lot of people say that it's typically a timing thing i'm wondering if anybody ever goes off of observation i haven't it seems like i haven't seen any coddle luring before they've eaten before okay chuck is that same with you yeah three three four months is maybe the earliest i've seen like okay actual caudal luring i mean where they're trying to get a prey at them i think sometimes you can look at them and they're just moving their tail but i think it's like a baby just like wiggling its foot like it's just rolling on the ground as an infant i don't know if they quite know what they're doing yet Got they it. don't yeah i mean i have that one that caught all lures that's the whole clutch is four four or five months old now and only one of them caught all lures. okay maybe if we waited maybe if we waited longer before trying maybe if we gave them three or four weeks that instinct would kick in yeah agree agree i fasted the entire clutch for 21 days and absolute savages when before they weren't hmm I've I've done that with my retake hatchlings now as I, you know, they'll have that first shed and I don't offer them until three, two, three weeks after that. Um, you know, unless I go in there at night and I see a couple, like if I see one, like really just cruising around every night, then I'll, I'll throw it. It typically will eat it right away. Mm -hmm. It Um, wasn't by, it, it wasn't by like, I didn't do that. Like, because I just had this like great idea of just busy and, the snakes maybe had 10 or 12 meals. And I said, you know what? They can go three weeks because I'm not going to sit here and screw with the whole damn clutch when they all took it great. The first two meals. And then they kind of shut off. I was like, they know what they they're doing. They, right. they, they made me work for it every other meal. And I was like, you know what? I'll give them 21 days. Cause I'm busy as all hell anyway. And man, it was five minutes. The entire clutch was fed boom through the whole rack. No problem. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second meal was seven days later. And it was a good feeding also. And then I'm going to do it again tomorrow. So we'll see what happens. They're about eight days since our last meal. So um, I want to take us uh, a little off topic before we have some wrap up questions. Um, just a random question. Um, <laughs> your your website is um, Vibrant um, Veritas. 
dot com and you know your business name as well and and i just thought of you know veritas in, in my head mm -hmm. um, but i'm curious what your thoughts are on the like different species of chondros um you know how they they split them up into four different species and and um obviously you're breeding designer animals so they're being crossed and i know that that obviously doesn't bother you but I'm, I'm curious if you've looked into those things do you do you see them as four different species um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I have very little viridus in my collection because, uh, like I said, I, I like red hatchlings and viridus are only yellow. So there probably is some Maru and Maruki worked into some of them. Um, I know they're different, the different species and subspecies. I think technically there are two species, one of which has two three three subspecies but um i don't know i don't worry about that stuff a whole lot it seems kind of arbitrary because the people who decided that they should be split up said oh they have this much divergence when you look at their molecular dna so that makes them different or they'll say well they i mean they, they look different from each other. So that means they're different species, but humans we're one species and we're, we all look, um, we look different from people from other continents. So yeah, there's that. And then as far as the, the percentage of, um, DNA difference, well, they're still capable of breeding with each other. So maybe their divergence isn't the end all be all because they're at the end of the day, they're drawing a arbitrary line. Right. No. You know, I've, I've never heard it put that way in the sense of humans, but that, that totally, <clears throat> that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty eye opening. Yeah. It I mean, it's, sense. that's, you know, I, I do think that there's a lot of merit and, and, uh, you know, I, I do appreciate the scientific community when it comes to, um, reptiles, because, uh, you know, again, coming from the retic world, like zero, nobody like no one's working on you know there there's only two subspecies of retics uh -huh. and there's there's i mean they have the largest span of any python uh -huh. um found in different parts of the world and and no one's doing it so i do appreciate you know the the people in australia and the you know people working on the the green tree pythons and you know that are um studying them very very detailed um so it is but but you do bring up a very good point um you know with the the human concept and comment um you know i also do think that sometimes the scientific community just needs something to do mm -hmm. um yeah and i'm not saying they're all the same i'm not saying they're all one species i'm just saying it's it, some of it's made up they're human constructs this isn't God coming down from heaven saying this is this and this is that. People are drawing lines. Yeah. And I do appreciate people preserving certain looks and keeping things separate. I'm not, I don't have a single uh, locality chondro or species or subspecies of chondro. And that's not because I don't appreciate them. It's just not what my focus is. But I think, I think there should be more of an emphasis on people breeding pure BX and a ruse and things like that. Right. Like I'm, I'm a locality geek, man, but it's, it's hard to, it, it's, it's hard to deny like an animal like this, <laughs> like mm -hmm. just some of the crazy OCCs that you see with designer stuff is absolutely insane. Yeah. Well, I, there are also a lot of people who say that designers are just locality crosses, but it's more than that. It's most, they're mostly designers because they've been selectively bred. People aren't just crossing things willy nilly and getting crazy looking snakes. Well, yeah, I think it's an ignorant statement to say that designers are are locality crosses. I mean, at the very basis and beginning, sure. Mm -hmm. However, lines are established by selectively breeding for phenotypes and taking it several generations in. Um, so it's it's a lot more than just you know. Let me throw this aru with this. Maruka yeah. and, and uh, now I have a designer one generation out. Try mm -hmm. over 40 years deep. 
perspective. So. Right. Ex- exactly. Um, Calico shit goes back forever. Um, um, Chuck, uh, wrap up question. You got one. I do. I do. And I didn't come up, come up with it myself. Very good friend of mine, Michael Majoros from Coloring Outside the Lines, is getting a plug and a shout out. And he told me this has to be my wrap up question, and I couldn't say no to it. So, what two chondros in history would you pair together if you had an opportunity to do that? Dead or alive? Dead or alive, or that are alive? No, 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 no. Dead or alive, any okay. chondro in history, what male and what female would you pair? Mm, I'll pick snakes that I don't own because that's more fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, man. Uh, well, my favorite clutch ever was probably um, Sid Harvest, just from uh, the barn. So Christian and Sean Stewart. I think that was around... It was 29 or 2010. It might have even been a little bit earlier. But they that there were snakes in that clutch that are crazy. And the two that I'm thinking of went to Europe to a guy that went by Doc Martini. I don't know his real name. But they were black and yellow. And the black was just so deep. It was different from most black chondras that you see. Really glossy, just pure black big patches and then the yellow was bright lemon yellow so and and there were two this this guy ended up with a male and a female and so i don't know which of those i would go with because i don't remember which one looked like what but i would take one of those and then um i'm not sure about the second snake but the one that comes to mind would be mosaic Mm. he's not around either but he kind of matched their phenotype to a certain extent. So that'd be a cool pairing. Cause you don't adding a little bit more color there too. Yeah. You get a lot of black and yellow and orange. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. That sounds like a good, I mean, mosaics gotta be, if mosaics not in everybody's top three, then I don't know what to say. Dude. I, I do love mosaic, but it's not, I'm fucking boring, dude. I like locality animals. I mean, me too, man. But let's let's think. Out, I mean, let's think outside the box here for a second. Let's let's have fun. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to give a shout out to Noel from Omega Serpents, and I'm going to give a shout out to Socrates. If I had my dream pairing, it would be Socrates' Star Scream Manicori male from Bushmaster. One of probably the most extreme blue dorsals ever, and. Uh, Noel has a female Tamika with a extremely similar blue dorsal and those snakes together would be absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. They would I'm, be amazing, but that's just my thing. It's a green snake with a blue dorsal. That's, that's right. I just right. want to think I want, I want glazer line looking shit here. <laughs> I like I'm going to, I'm going to, that's, that's what I'm going to try to do. My yeah. stuff. I couldn't even lie. I'm not even gonna lie. I don't. I wouldn't even. I need some time to even. I haven't even gone down the rabbit hole that far for me to give yeah. you guys an answer. It's a tough question to answer on the spot. It is. Um, you know, it would probably be something. Um, you know, honestly, I think in my top three favorite chondros. Um, I have to actually freaking pull it up because I'm terrible with freaking names but um i'd probably take gemini from the house of blues um that male good looking animal it's just that powder blue and you know my obsession with yellow diamonds chuck um it's just got that insane yellow diamond look and i don't know what the second animal would be i'd have to just dig and try to find something that has insanely contrasting yellow diamonds But yeah, um, all right. My my wrap up question definitely not as fun, but um, so where the hell did I put it? I had the document up. 
I got it. Um, so I, I guess I'm curious. Um, you know, I, I think it's possible for people to to breed and and uh, you know breed to bring in added income or income in general, but also just to because they enjoy it. But I'm curious for you. Dave, what is the end goal for these animals? Like producing them for fun? Are you having a specific goal in mind of where you want to be within the community or the animals or what you're trying to establish? I'm curious, like what what's the the end goal for what you're trying to accomplish with what you're doing? I don't think there is an end goal. I just want to produce the craziest looking snakes that I can. Awesome. I run I run it as a business, but it's that's not the intent. It's right. just an added benefit. Yeah. Right. I just want to, I guess one, one goal would be to have a collection made up of entirely snakes that I produced or nearly only snakes that I produced. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, uh, especially the, the size of your collection, that would be a, a, um, massive accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I like, I like hearing that answer. Um, and, uh, and again, I think that there's a, a very appropriate, and again, you know, I'm a, I love locality animals and every species and that's my, my passion, but I think there is a just as equally important place for the people like you that are just trying to make the most absurd, distinguishable, crazy looking snakes. Yeah. And, and I don't want it to sound like I'm a ball python breeder that only cares about the color of these things. I think more than that, I like green tree pythons because there's so many different factors to consider. Yeah. And like I said, I've fucked around and done a lot of different things. And as I move to my new house, I'm kind of looking at my past, keeping these things as just figuring out what I want to do and what I would, you know, what, what have I learned over the past 12 years and, and how, how, how have I fine tuned what I'm going to be doing moving forward? Right. Right. I mean, I guess moving, that's a good, good, a little good life event to really sit back and start reflecting. Yeah. It's like a clean break. If I could start all over, because I think of, you know, what, what, what have I done differently? If I knew the things back then that I know now, well, I can kind of do that now. Right. That's awesome. Um, Dave, man, pleasure having you on again to talk to you for the first time. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate the invite. Um, yeah, thank you, Dave. I appreciate you, uh, you know, responding and giving me your time. I really do appreciate it and coming on our show. Absolutely. My pleasure. Before we kick you out, do you mind just kind of plugging your social media where people can find you and how they can reach out to you if they want to buy an animal from you or inquire about any clutches? Where, where can they get that information? Sure. Uh, my website, vibrantviridus.com. I also have a Facebook page that I never post on, and I have an Instagram that I post on about once a month. So you can message me through through there. My email is sales at vibrantviridus.com. I don't have a lot available. I might have a few snakes available later this year, and I'll have a few next year. I don't sell anything until it's changed. So, Man, that's the one, one thing that I that – I hear more, I don't hear a lot of people say, but it, it's, it's like, I'm starting to feel it like in my, my heart here. If I ever get lucky enough and, and, uh, to, to produce chondros, um, mm -hmm. it just seems like a really good method to just, I mean, obviously if you're trying to create your own stock and, mm -hmm. and, uh, push it further, you can't always do that. If you're selling babies off the bat, you got to wait. Yeah. You can't tell. I mean, there are some appearances that give you a higher probability of turning out one way or another, but you never know for sure. I mean, people like to go for the dark babies. If we're talking reds, dark, dark browns with orange dorsals and that sort of thing. And that's a good indication, but you never know. Sometimes those bright red ones are the ones that end up being the best in the clutch. It is a lot of work holding them back though, because they're shit machines for the first year of their life. So you're doing a lot of cleaning. I think yeah. if you're, if your intent is to make money, it's probably, you're probably better off selling babies, but right. then you're also probably going to have a lot of uh, upset customers because they don't end up with, with um, what they had hoped for. Right. At the end of the day, I think everybody just got to have the mindset that it's all, it's, it's a gamble either mm -hmm. way. 
but <laughs> Dave, man, thanks again. Um, we'll, we'll let you go. We're going to send you to the back here. Um, but looking forward to talking more in the future. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks guys. Thanks Dave. You have a good night, buddy. It's good seeing you. Thank you. All right. Um, Chuck, man. Um, awesome episode. I love talking to people like, like Dave that just got, you know, decade or more of experience. And, and honestly, I was scrolling through that Instagram page that he has and, um, there, there's not a single conjure on there. That's not just mind blowing, but, um, you got anything else, uh, for listeners before we, we head out? Yeah, I do. I kind of got a, bo- a bone to pick with you over it. What's you up? need to stop discrediting yourself. What do you mean? You always say, if I'm lucky enough to, to breed, yeah, man, breed, breeding no. condos is not easy. No, exactly. Which exactly. means it, it, there's there's no luck involved. You make your own luck. Well, yeah, yeah. I think I mean, you're I an extremely good. I think you're an extremely good breeder. You're extremely good at with the things that you do. You have a lot of attention to detail, and I think that anybody can breed green tree pythons. It's, it's like, I'm just going to go on the record. Anybody can do it. However. If you're not dedicated and you don't have a lot of attention to detail and you're not extremely uh, pre-educated and you do uh, all your research beforehand and are prepared, you won't be successful. But if you do do that kind of stuff, then you will be successful. You can do it. It's just going to take a lot of time, and a lot of work. Yeah. That's it. Just yeah. pay attention. And that's to anybody, but especially you, like dude, you got the attention to detail. You're, you're very good at what you do. So if you like something, you're typically try to be good at it. So yeah, I think, yeah, I, think I think you're going to, you're going to be a great green tree Python breeder. I'll, 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 I think, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll get it down and then I'll lose my patience with getting them to eat and I'll send them to you and you'll get them to eat. And then <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll work out something, but um, <laughs> I, I appreciate, appreciate that. And yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's definitely not luck. I mean, I think people can get lucky with like first clutches um, and things like that. Um, you know, you see it all the time where people buy animals, put them together within a few months and they just right. But, but yeah, it, it definitely is, um, definitely a very, it, it's a skill thing to do with chondros. That's why the people who are successful at doing it are thought of so highly. Right. Yeah. Alyssa, and, and, and to just, you know, before we get out of here to, um, I guess, touch on what you said, I mean, yeah, you, there are people that have bred green tree pythons. And then there's green tree python breeders. Right, exactly. So I think you're going to be a fantastic breeder. You're already a fantastic retic breeder. You've proved that. So appreciate that, man. I, I think I think I know for a fact you'll be successful. Yeah, let's. Uh, yeah, this season, man. I'm I'm looking forward to winter time and doing my first pairings. Let's go. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening in, and we will see you in a couple weeks uh, on the Monday for episode seven of the Comptor Lounge. Y'all take care.